Welcome to the recording of this Partners 2020 Ask the Experts Industry Webinar. This session was hosted by our careers consultant for Maths, Stats and Physics, Amy Kingsman, and she was joined by our guests, Dr Phil Kay, who's an analytic consultant for Jump, and Carl Steele, who now works as a nuclear waste manager at Orono Projects after a prolific career spanning over 20 years at Sellafield. Each of these guests are going to provide a short presentation to tell you a little bit more about their career to date, as well as their background. Towards the end of the session, Amy will then lead them in a Q&A with questions that have been submitted prior to the webinar from you, the partner students. Without any further ado, we're going to hand over to Phil, who's going to tell you a little bit more about his career to date. Um, so I've got a few slides just to give you some visuals whilst I'm talking. Um, I'm going to talk through you know, what I do now. I'll talk through how I got into this line of work because it maybe wasn't completely obvious from um, how I started out in my education. So I work for a company called Jump and Jump is a software provider that helps scientists and engineers to understand their processes and, and how to get technology to market using data analytics. And Jump is a small part of a co company called SAS, that's SAS, and they're a huge global leader in data analytics and AI, big data, all these kind of things. Um, you may not have heard of them, they, but they're, they're big in the world of finance and insurance and retail and all these things. And um, our part really focuses very much on scientists and engineers and how we can help them to use data to solve their technical problems. My current role is learning manager in our global technical enablement team. And that means that I work with our biggest global customers. So some of the biggest customers, um, biggest companies that you can think of in, in uh, the world of semiconductor engineering, in pharmaceuticals, in consumer packaged goods. There are the kind of customers that I'm, I'm dealing with. And a big part of my job is to understand what their technical challenges are as scientists and as engineers and then show them how the kind of tools that we've got in our software can help them to solve those problems. So in normal circumstances, that means quite a lot of traveling and visiting and presenting, talking to scientists and engineers, running workshops with them, presenting seminars, having technical discussions with them. Um, and now, you know, we're continuing to do that, obviously, in, in the virtual world as much as we can. The second strand of what I do now is supporting our marketing. So you know, how do we let the world know about what our wonderful software does? So I'm, I'm involved in a lot of events, um, you know, conferences, webinars, and so forth, telling stories about how our software helps our customers, helps our customers in science and engineering to solve their problems. And that's, you know, how we grow our brand. That's, that's the, uh, the objective there. And then the third strand of what I do currently is um, to work with our new hires. And we have a, an onboarding program. And the objective there is to help the people that are new to our company to build a network of colleagues from around the world. So we're, we're very much a global organization and we want to facilitate the interaction of staff all over the world. We want our new hires to be comfortable talking about what we offer, talking about the, the brand for our software. And we also want them to have some familiarity, you know, when they're starting out with the kind of processes that we have in our sales and marketing. Prior to this role, I was a technical consultant within one of our teams in the UK. So I was focusing there on companies, industry around the UK. Um, again, you know, thinking of the, all the, the kind of big names in terms of pharmaceuticals, chemicals, consumer packaged goods, engineering. Um, I was working with them. So I've been doing that for about five or six years um, before I, I 
took on this more more global role. Before working for Jump, I my last role was working as a data scientist in speciality chemicals. I was working for a company called Fujifilm Imaging Colorants. So it's a part of the, the larger company, Fujifilm. And uh, this part of Fujifilm, what they do is they make uh, inks and materials for digital printing. So for inkjet printing, for, for laser printers, they make the, the colored stuff in them basically. Um, so, you know, hence this, this image here that I'm sure Fujifilm don't mind me sharing. My job was as a data scientist to, to consult with colleagues around the business to help them get more value from their data. So I was helping development chemists to get better data in the lab to experiment more effectively and efficiently using something called design of experiments, which is a, uh, a big part of my job now and, and what Jump offers for, for our customers. I was also helping our manufacturing colleagues. So I was you know, going into the manufacturing plants, helping them to solve problems using data, helping them to improve efficiencies, drive down costs, all of these things, you know, using data visualization, statistical modeling. And I even got involved in projects working with people in supply chain or in finance to help them do modeling and understand the consequences of you know, different what if scenarios. So that was what I was doing most recently before joining Jump. I was working as a data scientist. Um, before that though, you know, how I started out in industry was working as a lab development scientist. So I studied chemistry at university. Um, I did it at school. I found it easier than other people. It's probably the main reason why I did chemistry. And I went on and I did a PhD. Um, I did a year in industry in between uh, as part of my undergraduate studies, worked in industry, saw what that was like, did a PhD. And then after that went into the chemical industry as a lab development chemist. So I was working in the lab to work out how we take uh, a product, how we, we make a material that we've only made on a small scale, how we then actually make that on a much bigger scale. So you need to make this at the scale of like 20, uh, 20 tons or something like that. Um, so we had the challenge of understanding how you actually take something that you've maybe made once in the lab. How do you make that efficiently, cost-effectively, safely at a big scale? And this was when I started to get more interested in data because there's a lot that you can do with data analytics and statistics to help you with that. So there's some methods like statistical process control and design of experiments. And so as I got more experienced in the lab and you know, spent more time working on these processes, I learned more and more about these data analytic methods that would help. And I was lucky to get some in-house training in some of these methods. Um, I did a lot of self-learning as well. And it, ultimately, uh, I decided to do a, a part-time master's degree in statistics and applied statistics. Um, so that's kind of how I got to where I am now. Started out as a chemist, studying chemistry, um, but over time got more and more interested in data. Started to use it more and more myself, started to use the data analytics tools more and more myself then started to help my colleagues to do that. And that became my full-time job. Um, and now I'm in the position where I'm helping scientists and engineers all over the world to make use of these methods that I myself found so useful when I was working in the lab. Um, that's really my career in a nutshell. Um, I'll be really pleased to take some questions uh, when we talk through the Q&A later. Fantastic. Thanks, Phil. Um, we'll move on to um, Carol Steele now and we'll hear from um, Carol and his sort of career um, from there. Um, so, yeah, so my name's uh, Carl Steele. Um, I've uh, worked in the nuclear sector now for the vast majority of my career. Um, I joined a company called British Nuclear Fuels back in 1996. Um, and so I'll talk a bit about that. 
and uh, work that I've done uh, at Sellafield and then what I'm currently doing in terms of my consultancy work and um, the sort of skills and professional development that I've developed over the sort of the course of the 20 or so years. So just talk a bit about uh, Sellafield. Um, so I don't know if anyone knows much about Sellafield, but it's a very uh, complex and compact nuclear site. Um, the activities are centered around remediation, decommissioning, cleanup, um, and it spent a long time uh, reprocessing spent nuclear fuel from nuclear reactors. The site is operated by Sellafield Limited on behalf of the uh, UK Nuclear Decommissioning Authority. It's about 12,000 people that work on the site at any one time and it turns over approximately about £2 billion a year in uh, nuclear waste treatment services. Um, and um, I've spent, I spent the last 24 years working at Sellafield. I um, started off working in uh, spent fuel reprocessing in a thermal oxide reprocessing plant called Thorpe. And then I'd, I've had a number of careers, uh, a number of different jobs whilst at Sellafield. Uh, I left Thorpe to uh, join the high-level waste plants in 2004. And then since 2016, I took on a new role with analytical services, um, working in study management. And then since 2019, I've left Sellafield now, but I'm still providing support to Sellafield through my consultancy work. Um, working for a company called uh, Arano Projects Limited. So uh, just to describe some of the sort of things that I did whilst I was working in Thorpe. Um, so my background is uh, as a chemist, um, but um, over the course of my career, um, I've worked in multidisciplinary teams. So it's been uh, really important to have an understanding of maths, stats and physics um, and use that and uh, probably spent more time engaging with um, mathematicians and uh, uh, physics uh, graduates than I've actually spent time with actually chemistry uh, graduates so, you know, and a lot of time spending working with engineers as well. Um, so some of the things, the key activities that are developed whilst I was working in Thorpe is we developed a new catalyst for the uranium hydrogenation process, uh, developed a, uh, an operational flow sheet um, for the uh, product finishing lines, I identified um, alternative supplies of uranium nitrate liquor that was used as a reductant uh, in the hydrogenation process, and then also being directly involved with specifications and supply of chemicals as well to the process. So when I left Thorpe, I then went and worked into the uh, waste vitrification plants um, where my career progressed and I ended up becoming the technical manager in that area. Um, a very challenging environment. It takes highly active raffinate from spent fuel reprocessing and converts it into a, a glass product. Um, the, due to the, the radiation, um, everything is done in uh, shielded cells. So all of the operations are done remotely um, and it's a very challenging environment to work in, uh, trying to operate a process without being able to get your hands on and physically maintain it. So there's lots of issues with um, maintenance and breakdowns of, of key equipment at the, at the wrong time uh, during the process. Um, so also looked at developing uh, new glass formulations and um, also supported by the National Nuclear Lab to do full scale inactive trials and um, to develop a proce process flow sheet and also to look at replacing uh, equipment um, within the process itself. So, and then to give you a bit of an idea uh, in terms of my sort of key roles and responsibilities. So um, I ended up um, in a position where I was actually managing a multi-million pound research and development program. Um, and I had to manage it within a sort of cost variance of about 1% of the budget. So um, I tried to avoid um, becoming more involved with the accountancy as much as I could, but um, finance and accountancy are really integral part of any business. And so having an awareness of things like, you know, um, sort of SPIs, CPIs, cost variance, schedule variance, talking uh, at regular monthly uh, estimate of completion meetings to go through the accounts and report any cost variance. Um, so really, really important, um, those types of skills working in a commercial sector. Um, and then obviously 
the, the, the leadership as well. So as you progress through your career, you're likely to be uh, become more involved in managing not only the work that you do, but other people's work. And it's nothing quite really prepares you for that um, in a, um, an academic setting, um, unless you, you're given opportunities to supervise others. Um, so it's quite challenging, um, but it's rewarding as well to uh, help to develop other team members. So I was involved with uh, developing work packages um, for research and development activities, uh, leading external research activities. So working very closely with like Sheffield University, uh, Newcastle University and um, Strathclyde University and bringing people in through things like the Knowledge Transfer Partnership Scheme and sponsoring uh, PhD studies as well to support uh, developing research in key areas. Um, a lot of um, mathematical um, projects as well uh, involved in modeling and simulation. So uh, doing a wide range of different modeling uh, from operational research to support business uh, decisions through to general data analytics and uh, even uh, providing some support things like computational fluid dynamics and finance uh, element analysis. So acting as the intelligent customer and um, when I didn't really un fully understand the mathematics that were involved in those different types of processes. And then defining experimental work as well with the National Nuclear Lab and then trying to deliver the, um, the research and implement those improvements into a, a nuclear environment was um, extremely challenging working with the, the uh, manufacturing teams. So very much a sort of multidisciplinary approach, working with a range of people that have got completely different skill sets to yourself uh, from different disciplines. And then also acting as a, as a chair as well for um, the Waste Effluence and Dis Disposition Directorate, technical committees for peer review and endorsement of technical work and uh, a centre of expertise lead as well in th thermal treatment technology. So um, in terms of development of those skills, so um, ranging through my career, um, obviously starting off being able to, to write things and to improve your scientific communication is really, really key uh, skill that you, you need to develop. Um, not only um, internally for writing various reports and documents, but externally as well um, for presenting reports and articles and even giving presentations as well is a, a key skill to, uh, to develop. Um, having an understanding of nuclear safety and the industry that you work within, um, the practical problem solving. So understanding how to define a problem is probably the, 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 the most difficult part. Um, thinking that you already have the solution when in fact you don't really understand the problem. Is, is very uh, challenging and it can lead you down the wrong avenues um, and waste a lot of unnecessary time and effort. So learning about nuclear fuel reprocessing and the chemistry and the technology and the science behind uh, the different aspects of, of nuclear waste treatment and um, undertaking uh, project management to learn how to actually manage projects properly and what is the role of a project manager, what's the role of a sponsor um, how do you do, uh, develop all of the, the communication that you need to do to manage a, a successful project? Understanding financial awareness um, and acting as a, a, a commercial contracting officer um, with delegated duties um, in order to um, obtain supplies, of products and services through purchase orders and contracts and um, writing bids. So bid writing is really important. Um, for trying to actually go out and, and um, gain access to funds um, to, uh, to justify doing work, acting as intelligent customer on modeling and simulation projects, and then um, developing your coaching and mentoring skills as well. So you can not only uh, develop yourself, but develop others. Um, trying to run so no one really teaches you what skill um, to, to be able to do that. And um, things like um, networking, um, both in, in the UK and with overseas customers and clients. And then um, later on, um, gaining an awareness of what project management is and program management and how you go about managing studies. Um, 
So over the course of my year in time, uh, of my career in terms of uh, continuous professional development, so I started off um, with a, a obtaining a PhD uh, from Newcastle University back in uh, 1997, and then obtained a chartered chemistry state, uh, acted as an assessor for Innovate UK on different research proposals, and then back in 2016, I was awarded a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry, um, and then since then, um, obviously I know Phil through our engagement with the Royal Society of Chemistry and the, the Process Chemistry and Technology Special Interest Group. Um, I'd, I've put a list of publications, so I've, been, I've still been active in writing things throughout the course of my career, so I've never really um, uh, avoided um, being involved with uh, developing and um, publishing scientific work. I'm not going to talk about that in any detail, please to know. And then just to mention my most recent work, working for analytical services. Um, so the, it was a, a, a massive major project that uh, Sellafield are embarking on at the moment to uh, design and build a suite of new laboratories to replace their existing laboratories. So to give you some sort of context, um, the last time that Sellafield built a laboratory was back in 1950. So, so, so this sort of type of project only comes along once every sort of 50, 60 years. So it's like within a sort of a career or just outside of a career. And um, I was involved uh, in supporting that for a couple of years and um, just delivering some of the study work um, supported by a team of about four to six individuals. Um, and what we was able to do is to identify the requirement that we didn't actually need as many fumids as we originally thought. Um, we which uh, allowed for us then to uh, reduce the scope of the, the actual project and we stripped out about 100 million pounds out of the 700 million pound budget uh, for that um, and I think you know just because that, that shows the power of, of some of the work that you're able to do on how you can influence um, major projects and then what I'm doing now uh, at the moment for consultancy work for Arana projects so um, a lot of people won't have heard of Arana it's a major multinational company which is based in France and it covers all aspects of the nuclear fuel cycle and employs about 16,000 people worldwide um, and turns over about four billion pounds uh, of, of uh, euros. About 33% of the business is in uranium mining to make uranium nuclear fuel. 23% um, is in the uranium enrichment and the fuel manufacture. And then the other 43% of the business covers everything from recycling of nuclear fuel, providing um, manufacturing nuclear packages and transportational services to move items around the world, and uh, an engineering dismantling and decommissioning service. So um, I was recruited to Arano um, in uh, May last year uh, to set up a, a waste management consultancy team. And uh, since then, we've, we've won a, a couple of contracts and that's allowed us to bring in some extra individuals into the team. And we're hoping to um, gain more work in the, the next year or so to allow us to strengthen our team and, and build um, more nuclear waste uh, consultancy capability. And then a sort of uh, last slide is really sort of, so what have I learned over the last sort of 25 years of working uh, in a business environment? So, you know, key question, you know, are you prepared for work? Because I certainly wasn't. Um, I tried to avoid working for as long as I possibly could uh, by studying PhD, but uh, then there was no choice but to go and, and find a proper job. Um, so, and how many people actually plan out their career? So my career, really, um, there wasn't any, any strategy to it. Um, a lot of it was down to uh, serendipity and opportunities presenting themselves throughout the course of your career. Um, and don't underestimate um, what you know, who you know, and, and what you know. They're both equally important. So networking now, the people that I know that have progressed in their career, um, they're, they're a massive network of, of contacts um, to help you, and um, you know, support you throughout the course of your career. Um, and obviously, your learning just doesn't end when you graduate. Um, it's just the start. A degree gives you a, um, an opportunity to, uh, to go into the, the uh, business you know, working environment, but it is really the start. It's just, it's just that uh, you know, 
opportunity to open a door for you to, to actually do something that you enjoy. And I would yeah, strongly re recommend that to try to look for a job that you think you're going to enjoy and not one that pays the most because you can quite easily get bored with it, uh, uh, you know, and then wonder what you're doing. And I think, to be honest, if I'd been better at maths, I definitely wouldn't have been a chemist because I've spent a lot more time talking with mathematicians and dealing with um, cal uh, formulations and, and, um, and calculations. And um, your ability to adapt really in the environment is much more important than your initial scientific skills, you know, although they are still very important. Um, so I hope I can share those. And being able to develop your transferable skills, you know, um, communication. So being able to tell a story or a joke, being able to simplify things, uh, a willingness to work in teams and support other colleagues, and, and being able to take personal responsibility to get things done. The, the strategy groups that um, you know employers really uh, admire and look for individuals. So I hope that's helpful. Yes, thank you very much um, to both of you, um, Phil and Carol, for that. That was really great insights and some really useful nuggets in there. So. We now have um, some time to take some questions from you. Um, I'm going to start off with, um, how long did it take you to um, get into your first graduation role after you first graduated? I, I, to be honest, I struggled quite a lot to mm -hmm. find a job um, that I wanted to do. So I started off when I finished um, working in Bedlington um, for a company called Simpact Pharmaceuticals as a temporary uh, quality assurance analyst working, uh, doing shift work. Mm -hmm. um, and so it took me about a good, almost like a year, really, to get to get to an opportunity where I was working um, for uh, British Nuclear Fuels. Mm -hmm. um, I'd a, at the time, obviously, it was sort of that time when the internet was only its infancy, so mm -hmm. it's not the same as it is now um, in terms of networking. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, I'd applied for about 30 different roles, and I managed to get five or six interviews out of those 30 roles, right. but I was quite selective in terms of the jobs that I applied for. But no, it's, it's definitely not easy to get your foot mm. in the door and, and mm. to get a job that you actually, you know, you're going to enjoy and, and make a career out of. For sure. And would you have any advice for a student or a graduate? You know, what advice would you see of trying to get that foot in the door? If there's any pointers and if you give anyone? Yes, yeah, so, yeah, really important, your, your, your network and, mm. and the wider network as well. Mm. So I think now with tools like LinkedIn, the, the really good, really powerful tools to if you connect to people that are outside of your local network. Mm -hmm. So I would advise people to, to use the social media platforms uh, yeah. rather than the you know the traditional um, application to mm -hmm. uh, HR department, which might mm -hmm. not you know get the right response. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, absolutely, a really good tool, and it's something that we're encouraging more and more in the university of the students and graduates to be using and to be quite active on there. So. Um, yeah, we do even have some central sessions and things like that that we do around LinkedIn and how to utilise it. So, um, great tool. What about yourself, Phil? How long did it take you to get into your first graduate role? Uh, so I was, um, I did my PhD and um, my initial three years of funding ran out um, mm -hmm. and I was still writing up my thesis. Um, so I was doing that for a number of months and then it got to the point where I just completely ran out of money. So I needed to get a job. Um, I was lucky um, or, you know, I, I mentioned that I did a year in industry during my undergraduate degree mm. um, and it just so happened that when I was looking for a job, the company um, and in fact my manager from when I was doing that year in industry were, were looking for, for lab chemists. Um, so it didn't take me very long actually. Um, so that was, I was definitely glad that I'd done that year in industry and mm. programs like that are a really good way to get your foot in the door if you can. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, you know, that was a, a very, very junior level job. Um, and, you know, I was able to, to um, after all, I, you know, I was, I was kind of working in the lab, you know, just being the, uh, the kind of uh, dog's body really around the site, picking up samples from here and there for, for quite a long time, really, um, mm -hmm. but just stuck with it. And then, you know, there were opportunities to then progress my, my career within that company, as I said. Excellent. And with, uh, obviously, you've heard we were talking with Carol there about networking. What was your thoughts around that? And how would, what would you advise and how graduates could go about starting networking? 
Yeah, I mean, that's something that I've always found a bit scary, personally. Mm. I'm not kind of um, a really extrovert kind of person. And you kind of think of people that are good at networking as being the, you know, the the kind of the person who's, you know, always the, the loud person at the party kind of thing. And that's, mm. that's not me, but I think there's, there's other ways of building networks uh, as I've found. Um, I completely agree with Carl that LinkedIn is a really fantastic tool mm -hmm. and not just for looking for jobs or making yourself, uh, you know, visible for people that are looking for, for people to employ. It's just a really great way of kind of engaging in mm. meaningful ways with, with the community. And, and you know, I've used it to get, technical advice from people mm -hmm. and these kind of things you know at the, at the point where you do them they may not seem may not seem really obvious why that's helping you in your career yeah. but all these little things every time you engage with that community be it through mm -hmm. linkedin or be it mm -hmm. through a professional body like the royal society of chemistry mm -hmm. each little thing is just incrementally helping you to to build that network and mm -hmm. you know you just find eventually people are kind of aware of who you are and people mm. ask you to, you know, come and help with this Newcastle university careers event, mm -hmm. um, just through all the little things that you've done over those years to, to mm. kind of engage with people. Yeah, I would certainly agree with that. And certainly I know for some students and graduates, like you were saying, Philly, it, it, it can be sort of off putting to think of networking as you think you've got to be super outgoing and, you know, start conversations and things, but you're right in saying it is sometimes just these little things, even of joining into sessions like this and, you know, asking questions or even just going along to things that we've got going on in the university, etc. And I think something to even highlight to students and graduates is the, the people they're in, you know, their lecture theatres with and in seminars with, they're actually in their network already. So they're networking without even knowing they're networking. So um, it's amazing how people come back in contact with one another once they get into the world of work. So, yeah, absolutely. How do you both feel your university experience helped you in your career? I don't know. That's quite a broad question, but. Um, I, so I, as I mentioned, I kind of went into chemistry because I found it easier than other people. Um, uh, and, you know, I enjoyed it, but I've subsequently found really it wasn't absolutely where my passion lay. Mm. Um, uh, having said that, you know, I think it does, it, it gives you lots of fantastic learning and experience um you know it, it's not so so much about what you learn in terms of the, the kind of things that you have to remember for you know for passing the exams uh, you know a lot of that is useful mm -hmm. but actually you know the kind of things that i learned about chemistry um I, I haven't used a great deal in my career i think what's more useful is is kind of learning how to learn you know and it's mm -hmm. it's proving to yourself that you can learn um, because, you know, as Carl mentioned in his slides, you know, most of the things, the, the, the really important things that he's learned that have helped to advance him through his career have been things that he's learned since. Um, mm. But you need to kind of be open to learning. And I think new, being at university really prepares you for that. It prepares mm. you for the discipline um, and for the appetite for learning. Um, and particularly, you know, I, I'm really glad I did a PhD. I mean, it's not for everybody. I, I don't think everybody needs to do a PhD. But for me, it was it was fantastic experience of having to work on something myself. You know, there was no right answer at the end of it. It was mm. about here's a question to go and explore. You know, it's a question that nobody else has answered before. We don't know how to answer it. We don't know what the answer is. There is no right answer. You're just going to learn something and it might be useful for humanity or it might be something that's not particularly, which in the end mine was, but the, you know, it was the most beneficial thing. It wasn't what I learned about chemistry. It was learning to manage a project by myself. And mm. that's given me so much confidence. You know, when I went into industry, I was then prepared to take the opportunities to progress my career because I had the confidence that I've done this, you know, I've managed my own projects myself. I, I, you know, I've got experience, I've got confidence in my abilities. And um, that's really what I got from my, my academic career. Carol, do you have anything you want to add into that? Yeah, I, I think university, it gives you that opportunity, doesn't it, between um, school and work, where you've got a bit of time to uh, discover yourself, mm -hmm. to mature, and to to make yourself um, more more uh, you know top uh, sellable, uh, but also to um, to 
to, to sort of broaden your horizons, mm. to look at things that you, you know that you enjoy. Um, and but that the other, yeah, I suppose the the pit side is really that the the focus is on the the academic element. So it's all about you know uh, producing assignments and um, you know uh, problem solving and uh, you know and, and passing exams and. Mm. Um, from from that side of things, the, the the benefits really for me was on the being able to understand the problems and, and how we approach a problem, because you know you're going to experience that um, in uh, a uh, industrial business environment, and that you know as as Phil says that um, there aren't uh, necessarily any wrong or right answers to, to a lot of these things, and nobody's written the rule book, you know, so mm. there's standard process to follow you need to figure things out as you go and mm. that um, sort of aptitude and that that willingness and enthusiasm um, to actually um, you know to put yourself out there and to um, you know to build your confidence mm. in a working environment I think that you know the, the university gives you, helps you with with those sort of transferable skills mm, absolutely and what if I don't know if either of you have experience within hiring or even sort of being hired, but if you were thinking about saying some things in which you think would be useful if graduates thinking, what would make a graduate more hireable? I don't know if you've got any thoughts or ideas on that. Um, yeah, because so what I did was asked, I contacted the uh, Royal Society of Chemistry uh, Careers mm -hmm. Advice um, mm -hmm. uh, in about 2018 when I was right. looking to, to change jobs. Mm. And um, they uh, they put me um, the, the lady that I spoke to gave me some advice. There's a book by John Leeson um, mm. on how to find your perfect job. I think it's something like that. It's called, mm. and it gives you there's a, a series of like uh, exercises that you can do mm. to try to understand what it is that you're looking for, mm. you know, and, what, and where where you would um, you know benefit from mm. um, you know what career you're after because everyone's got different interests, mm. and I think that um, really that them. Uh, following things through your own natural curiosity and mm -hmm. uh, an interest and enthusiasm is a much way, a much better way to try to um, develop your career mm -hmm. than you know just going after um, you know award and, and recognition. Mm -hmm. So really, sort of getting to know yourself and thinking about who you are and what skills you have and what things you would enjoy doing. You think that be what yeah. students and graduates should be thinking about. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Build any nuggets of insight into that one? Um, I do think a key skill for anybody in any job is communication. Um, mm. And that it can mean lots of different things. Mm. I, again, you know, I personally, um, I spend a lot of my job presenting through, you know, webinars and things like that. And I absolutely, I love it. I get a real buzz from it. But I know that for other people, that's just their idea of hell. Um, so by communication, I don't mean, you know, being able to present confidently in front of hundreds mm. of people for some roles that really is very important, but for, for other things, it's, it's less so I think, um, but we all have to be able to communicate. We all have to be able to work well as a team. Um, I, I think that's, you know, in hiring somebody, that's something that I'm, I would always be looking for is just that ability to communicate with, with clarity, mm. um, and, with honesty you know i think there's we don't always have to um always know the answer to everything i think as long as we're we're kind of uh, clear about what we know and we don't what we don't know i think that's that's the most helpful thing mm -hmm. um so you know i'm looking for people that can communicate clearly and also um are humble enough to to recognize that they've they've still got a lot to learn and, mm -hmm. and that they're willing to learn um that makes for you know that's that's the kind of person that you want to work with ultimately mm, absolutely in terms of the communication skills you did see yourself it's quite a, a broad set of skills being able to communicate effectively and some people be able to communicate like with the presentation really well but maybe in other types of communication not so well so do you have any tips or hints on how communication skills can be developed i don't know if you have any thoughts on that well like a lot of these things i think it's it's partly about taking the opportunity, you know, so mm. um, a lot of the things, the skills that I've learned through my career, um, it's because I've taken the opportunity to, to, to 
force myself to do it basically mm. somebody's asked me can you do this uh, and I've basically said well I don't know how to do it now but I'd love to try um, I, you know I'm happy to to have a go at this and I'll learn how to do it by doing it um, and I think communication is 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 the same um, so you know just take the opportunities to, to give presentations even when you don't maybe want to but you know I think it's mm. it's always a good learning experience or to you know to write reports um, when when you know when you get the opportunity the main thing i would you know say in terms of communication is is keep it simple mm -hmm. um i think from our background as, as scientists or mathematicians we we obviously love complexity we, mm -hmm. we we're in a world where we we kind of uh we're in it because we know that the world is complex and we want to find um you know answers to these complex problems often your audience doesn't care about the complexity. They don't care about how difficult it was to find the solution. They just mm. care about what the solution is. Um, mm. So it's very tempting. I've, I've fallen into the trap a lot of times myself where I just want to tell everybody how difficult this problem was to solve and how, mm. how great and clever I am that I could work all this stuff out mm. um, when actually you know, nobody cared about those 12 pages of the report. They just wanted the mm. front cover and the, and the end conclusion really. Mm. Um, so I think from, from our perspective as scientists, mathematicians, engineers, um, we often need to keep it much more simple than we would uh, generally be comfortable with doing. Mm. That's really good advice. Well, I've actually had a question in the chat here um, and it says, what was the most important skill or lesson um, you learned either during university or at the start of your career? That's quite a difficult one, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> um, yeah, I, th I think, yeah, I think generally it's probably um, that, you know, uh, understand your own limitations. Mm. You know? um, don't try to oversell yourself, you know, mm. um, because, you know, someone will, will figure out that you're, you're trying to fake it, mm. you know. Um, and so, you know, that sort of the... Uh, yeah, it was, but yeah, just, just, yeah, be, be true to yourself and, and find something that you want to do, you know. Yeah, I think that's absolutely key. Um, mm. Just on a very practical point of view, though, I think one of the most important skills is is time management. And it's something mm. I continually struggle with, um, I, particularly over committing to uh, things when I don't really have the time to do them all. Um, so I'm, I'm still trying to learn about that i wish i could be a bit more disciplined about it to be honest but um mm. the, the things i have learned about time management have definitely been really useful for me mm. great and the other thing i was just thinking there is thinking often from a career's point of view we quite often talk about um you know how to get into the graduate lobby marker and you know how to get the jobs and things like that but i'm wondering when you first started working was there anything about the world of work that surprised you or shocked you in any way that you weren't quite prepared for yeah and um, for me joining a large organization um you don't have that inbuilt network mm. so to become a, an effective employee within an organization that's quite, you know, quite large in size, you, you, it takes you about six months just to get used to the environment that you're working in and the, mm. the business processes that are being used and, and who, who to go and ask the right question to because people will, will pass you around, you mm. know, and, and then you come back to the same person that you asked the, the, the question with the first time. So, yes, yeah, so, so, yeah, so it does take a, a long time to establish that network and establish your reputation within an organization. Mm. Yeah, I think that's um, one of the things I learned early. Um, one of my, my you know, early failings was really not asking for help enough, um, you know, mm. not drawing on the experience of other people. Um, again, kind of feeling like, you know, coming from university when you've got uh, an assignment you have to do it yourself you know <laughs> um, mm. you're not allowed to get other people to help you or you know obviously you can get help from your, your tutors and whatnot but if you know you sit an exam it's you're going to answer the questions mm. um, in, in the world of work that's completely different you should be drawing on the experience of, of everybody else around you and getting them to help you um, but you know the biggest I think one of the biggest shocks for me from coming from an academic background into industry was kind of relating to what I was saying about communication before it, you know going into industry it, 
became very clear that really nobody cares how you get to a solution. Just mm. you just need to make things work in industry. Um, in, in academia, you know, it's all about the 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 process of learning and and, and you know understanding things at a fundamental level. Um, so shifting into industry, it was a bit of a shock to me that actually nobody really cares about how clever the solution is. It's just about, you know, we need to work out how to make this work so that we can, we can sell it. And mm. so that we, you know, the company is profitable. Um, so people might find that a bit of a, something to adjust to in going from, from academia into industry. Great. I'm curious to know, and maybe you, neither of you are, but I'm curious to know if either of you are part of professional bodies and if that's had any sort of beneficial impact on your career or the start of your career. Yeah, um, so obviously me and Phil uh, both um, support uh, Royal Society of Chemistry uh, on the, the Process Chemistry and Technology Group, a special interest group. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, so I do uh, some assessments for Royal Society of Chemistry as well for, for chartership and revalidation. Um, but yeah, that's that's probably as much as I can do really to fit everything in with my mm. work and my home life as well. Mm. And, um, you know, it's easy to say yes to do things, mm. but it's quite difficult to say no at times. Yeah. You know, and so if the the well, if you do make yourself useful in a uh, you know in your business, then you're likely to get more work because people will come and ask you to help you because they know they can trust you. Yeah. So um, you know, uh, I would I would say that um, it's it's knowing when to say no is is, mm. the, is the skill. Good. Yeah, I mean, I've uh, it's. As Carl says, I'm a member of the Royal Society of Chemistry mm. um, and I have been for quite a number of years. And I think for a while, um, I wasn't really sure what I was getting from it. Um, mm. But I think it was a case of um, now I'm getting a huge amount from it and it's because I'm actually giving more to it as well. Mm. Um, so I'm, Carl and I are both on the Process Chemistry and Technology Group um, Committee uh, and I'm involved in it through, you know, organizing events through that and um, also through my my day job we're also working closely with the Royal Society of Chemistry so there's a lot of really great benefits for me personally for mm. for the company that I work with um, and you know, that hopefully that's also benefiting the, the wider community of chemists and, and scientists out there um, so again it's about you know getting involved and maybe it's only in small ways to begin with and then ultimately you can you can commit a bit more um, more and more of your time um, mm -hmm. as much as as time allows um, but yeah just you you'll you'll get out of it what you put into it absolutely and for a lot of these professional bodies you can get like student memberships and things as well so if there are students watching then they can get involved maybe in small ways as well it's fantastic how important do you think, I don't know if either of you were involved in this when you were at university or even just even thinking about it retrospectively, but thinking about um, extracurricular act activities, did that play a role in your career in any way or? Um, I have to say it didn't particularly in my case. I probably mm. um, didn't get involved in the, the extracurricular activities as mm. as much as I should have done. I don't, don't think I, re, you know, I kind of regret not taking more of a, an opportunity to do that whilst I was at university. Mm. Um, but, you know, you, you do find um, that, uh, you know, as I was talking with networking before, you know, it, it's not a kind of predictable um, process. You know, mm. you've, you'd, you don't you kind of you can't go into a situation trying to um trying to further your network i don't think in in some kind of tangible predictable way mm. it is just about doing things and i'm sure you know membership of uh, university um uh, interest groups and and you know extracurricular activities all these little things it is it is building that network so you know if mm. that's if that's the kind of way that you you know you like to to engage with other people then then do it i think it's just about having different ways of, of engaging with people and and what's most comfortable for you absolutely yep great yeah and i guess if you know when when i ever see um like candidate cvs you know mm. um so the sort of things that sort of stand out on the sort of the the personal interests mm. is where they've actually been involved with like fundraising or something like that, you know, okay. where they've gone out and, and, and helped um, others, you know, or been, you know, a, a directly involved with some sport or organising some sporting activities. 
because mm. that that skill of administration organization is yeah. really transferable into a business role mm -hmm. so you know you shouldn't underestimate that you're gonna you get by being involved with other groups that you're actually going to learn other skills and yeah. whilst you're doing that absolutely yeah it's just interesting to hear quite often people's extracurricular activities have some kind of impact on their career so and um, it was just quite interesting to get your take on that I don't have any other questions here written down. Um, there's no questions other come through the chat. So I don't know if you maybe want to end it off with maybe just a piece of advice um, for any students or graduates going into the job market. I think that might be a nice way to, to round it off. Um, I think uh, the, the job market has changed a lot in the last mm. 25 years since, mm. since I've um, started um, uh, in, you know, in industrial environment. And I guess those days, where you could guarantee that you'd start working with a sort of multinational or large corporation and you'd continue to work for the same organization uh, that's that's completely gone now and mm. um, the likelihood is that you're going to be changing your job you know every every few years you know mm. so you might be lucky if you spend 10 or 15 years in one organization mm. so i think you need to always be aware of your continuing professional development mm. and uh, look for opportunities as they present themselves, you know, yeah. and not expect that you're going to be working for the same company for the rest of your life. I think that's really, really good advice, yeah. Yeah, I, I would just second that. Just keep your eyes open for opportunity. Um, mm. I think the people who end up being uh, lucky in life are the ones that have really just kept kept their eyes and ears open for, for opportunity. Um, you know, I think there's that old quote that, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Um, mm. So it's um, it, my career and, and Carl's career, you know, neither of us, I don't think we really planned uh, our careers to work out this way. Mm. Um, it's about being, you know, flexible um, and making the most of the, the, the chances that you get out there. Absolutely. I think that's a really good place to, to end it on there. Um, so thank you so much to um, both yourself, Phil and Carol for joining us this afternoon. It's really much appreciated at the university and with myself as well. So, and obviously with the students listening. Thank you for tuning into this recording of the Partners 2020 Ask the Expert session. We hope you found the discussion and the presentations from our guests useful and insightful. Remember to stay up to date with further advice from alumni and industry professionals. Subscribe to our Newcastle University Career Service YouTube channel and you can follow us on our social media channels at NCL Careers on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. We hope to see you in September. Good luck and take care.